Hello everyone, this is Firoz Nadav. In this video, we will see design of isolated footing. We will see what are the steps involved in the design of isolated footing. In the next video, uh, we will see the numerical based on the steps uh, that we will see in this video. Uh, you see, with respect to what are the types of isolated footing, depending on the shape of isolated footing, we have different different types of isolated footing. We have pad footing. In the pad footing, the depth of the footing is uniform. Then we have sloped footing. In the sloped footing, we provide some slope from the column to the footing. And in the stepped footing, it is evident from the diagram, we provide some steps of the footing. Okay, so you see, what is the purpose of isolated footing? What is isolated footing? Okay, isolated footing is a footing for a single column. And its purpose is to transfer the load from that column to the soil. Okay, so this is what is isolated footing. Then in the design procedure, what will be given to you? If you want to design an isolated column, some data will be given to you in the problem. So they will give you what load is coming from the column. What load you need to transfer to the soil through footing. That load will be given to you. It, it could be service load or it could be ultimate load and they will also give you what is the capacity of the soil in terms of safe bearing capacity or bearing capacity of the, of the soil will be given to you okay so uh, we will see what are the steps involved in the design procedure first we have to determine size of the footing size of the footing first we have to determine what is the area of the footing then we can fix the dimensions uh, of the footing. Now you see the dimensions of the footing, you will get the area. After getting the area, you have to fix the dimensions of the footing. The dimensions of the footing largely depends on the dimensions of the column. Okay. If the column is square column, simply you can provide square fitting. You don't have to worry about if this if the column is a square column. If it is a rectangular column, then you have to take care. Okay, so you have to provide rectangular footing, but you cannot haphazardly provide a rectangular footing. Rectangular footing should be provided, it should be proportional to the size of the column. Whatever rectangular footing you will provide based on rectangular column, that rectangular footing should be proportional to the size of the column. Okay, so if this is the <clears throat> rectangular column that you have L is the length of the column and B is the width of the column then length of the footing should be proportional to the length of the column similarly width of the footing should be proportional to the width of the column so in this way we will provide the rectangular footing which is proportional to rectangular column okay then this, this is the formula by which we find area of the footing e equal to load by SBC safe bearing capacity of the soil you see load here it's a total load including self weight of the footing okay and P is the load coming from the column plus 10 percent of the column load and what is this 10 percent of the column load it is self weight of the footing so initially you see you don't know the size of the footing you don't know the dimensions of the footing and in that case you cannot find the self weight of the footing so at the initial stage, we have to assume some percentage of column, some percentage of columns load as self weight of the footing. And normally we assume 10% of column load as self weight of the footing. So here load means total service load, including self weight of the footing. Okay. So you see, in I, uh, IS code has clearly stated that when you are determining size of the footing, you only have to take the service load. If ultimate load is given to you in the problem then you have to convert that ultimate load into service load and you have to determine area of the footing okay so <clears throat> this is what is coming p plus 0.1 p 1.1 p divided by sbc of the soil in step number two we will determine upward pressure or reaction from the soil column is rested on the footing footing is rested on the soil so there will be some reaction from the soil there will be some upward pressure from the soil normally it is denoted by qu so this is the formula that we have to determine upward pressure qu equal to 1.5 p 
where P is load from the column divided by area of footing provided. In step number one, you have provided some area of the footing. Whatever area of the footing that you have provided, that area should be taken in calculating upward pressure. Okay. In step number three, we have to determine the depth of the footing. Depth of the footing is determined based on three criteria uh, that we have bending moment, one way shear, and two way shear. Okay, so we will calculate depth of the footing based on all these cri three criteria and we will see which criteria is giving maximum depth of the footing. Okay, so the normal practice is that the depth, the depth of the footing will be calculated based on one way shear. And then uh, whatever the depth of the footing you will get based on one way shear, it will be checked for bending moment and it will also be checked for punching shear. Okay, so it has to satisfy the bending moment criteria. It also has to satisfy the two way shear criteria. This is one practice. Another practice is that you'll find the depth of the footing based on bending moment, based on one way shear and based on two way shear and you will provide uh, the maximum depth of the footing based on these three criteria, and you will also see which criteria is giving the maximum depth of the footing. Okay, in step number four, we will see the determination of D based on bending moment criteria. We have to define uh, where is the critical section for the bending moment. Critical section for the bending moment is at the face of the column. This is the plan of the footing then you have plan of the column so at the face of the column itself you have the critical section for the bending moment and uh, if you see from the front side the critical section will be at this point so at this point you have to find the bending moment okay you have to consider whatever the load is coming on the footing and at this point at this particular point which is the critical section you have to find the bending moment now the pressure is there from the soil which is in the form of kilonewton per meter square. QU is in kilonewton per meter square. Uh, you no, normally you see UDL is in kilonewton per meter. We have to convert kilonewton per meter square into kilonewton per meter. So we can do that by multiplying <coughs> with res by multiplying the width of the footing. If you multiply width of the footing to this uh, QU, the unit will become kilonewton per meter okay so you see it is just like a cantilever beam a fixed support is nothing but face of the column fixed support is nothing but critical section for the bending moment okay so you have the udl you are converting the udl into kilonewton per meter by multiplying width of the footing now we have to find what is the length of the cantilever beam okay so this is the L that you have length of the footing, then you have small l, small l is length of the column. So the length of the cantilever portion, the length from the <coughs> left side of the footing to the critical section will be capital L minus small l divided by 2. So this is the length of the cantilever beam, you can say, you can use cantilever beam for understanding purpose. Okay. So bending moment at the fixed support is Q u into b this is the udl in kilonewton per meter then into l you see the uh, maximum bending moment in a cantilever beam subjected to udl is w l square by 2 where w is udl l is length of the footing okay so l square by 2 so this formula you are getting to determine the maximum bending moment or bending moment at the critical section Okay, so this is the bending moment formula at the critical section. Uh, now we have to see how to determine depth of the footing by using this formula. Okay, so you see grade of the steel will be given to you in the problem itself. Whether you have to use Fe250, Fe415, Fe500, it will be given to you. And based on that, you can get the value of MULIM. For Fe250, MULIM is 0.148 FCK B D square. Even grade of concrete will also be given to you. So depending upon the grade of steel, you have three different formulas of MULIM. For Fe415, this is for Fe250. For Fe415, it is 0.138 FCK 
b d square okay this is for fe 4 and 5 and for fe 500 it is 0.133 fck b d square okay so what you have to do you have to equate whatever bending moment value you will get you will get some value of bending moment because the dimensions uh, will be clear to you up to this step so you will get the bending moment value so when once you get the bending moment value you have to equate the bending moment value with respect to mulim M and mulim you have to take from the grade of steel so uh, fck is known to you b is also known to you what is b b is the width of the footing so in step number one you have decided what is the dimensions of the footing so b is clear to you so what is unknown here is d d is unknown so once you equate bending moment with respect to mu lim you will get the effective depth of the footing based on bending moment criteria okay now we have to determine depth of the footing based on one way shear so here first you have to determine where is the critical section for one way shear in case of footing so critical section is at a distance d from the face of the column from face of the column okay so this is the column that you have then this is the footing so at a distance d from face of the column you will have the critical section the point is that at this point you have to find the shear force and then you have to find the shear stress if you draw the plan plan of the footing and the column it will be like this okay so this is the plan of the footing and then plan of the column so at a distance d from the face of the column you will have the uh, one way shear critical section for one way shear okay so this is the shaded area the point is that you have to determine what is the shear force at this point okay so this is q u into b which is in kilonewton per meter so you have to determine what is the shear force shear force shear force at the critical section at the critical section you know how to determine shear force uh, udl udl is q u into b this is the udl into length up to the critical section length from this to this point okay so now already you know this length from uh, this point to the face of the column capital l minus small l by 2 okay so from here to here from this point to this point the length is l minus 2 sorry l uh, capital l minus small l divided by 2 minus small d so this is the length that you have okay so shear force at the critical section q u into b into length this length that we have to multiply here l minus small l by 2 minus d after getting the value of tau v you have to find tau c from is 456 2000 okay so what is tau c tau c is shear strength of the concrete so generally speaking in the case of shear in the case of shear behavior uh, what we say if tau v is greater sorry if tau v is less than tau c then we say that our design is safe against shear safe against shear in case of beam in case of slab even in the case of footing we do this we compare tau v with respect to tau c what is tau v tau v is shear stress and tau c is shear strength of the concrete if this is if this case is not satisfied if tau v is greater than tau c then in that case we have the design is not safe against shear uh, we have to increase the depth of the footing so much so that uh, we get tau v uh, less than tau c how to find tau c tau c depends on two factors it depends on grade of concrete 
grade of concrete grade of concrete will be given to you in the problem and it also depends on percentage of steel so what is known to you when you are finding tau c in this step grade of concrete is known to you but percentage of the steel is not known to you because we have not yet calculated the area of steel in the footing okay so what you have to do uh, normally you know the ranges how much percentage of steel you provide in case of footing based on the experience so what we say normally the range is 0.2 to 0.25 percent we provide the, the steel we provide in the footing so you can assume any value or you can assume these values uh, as a percentage of steel in the footing so based on this two value you have to find the tau c value from is 456 456 table number 19 table number 19 page number 73 okay so from this table you will get the value of tau c just have to see the grade of concrete and the percentage of steel so after getting the value of tau c you have to equate tau v uh, with tau c what is tau v? Tau v is shear force at the critical section. You have to write the formula. So the formula I have written, uh, you can take that. Divided by D into capital B equal to tau c. You have some value of tau c you have to put here. You will get some value of shear force and you also know the width of the footing. What is unknown to you is small d. Small d is unknown to you. And from this equation, you will find small d with respect to one way shear criteria one way shear criteria depth of the footing based on two way shear or punching shear two way shear means we have to see the shear in both the direction in x direction as well as in y direction it is also called as punching shear uh, there is some sort of punching created on the footing or on the soil some part of the area of the footing is going downward in downward direction and some part of the footing is going in the upward direction we will see how to understand this part okay so uh, you see the critical section for two way shear is at a distance d by 2 from the face of the column in both the direction in x direction as well as in y direction okay so this is the plan of the footing that we have then we have plan of the column okay and critical section is at a distance d by 2 from this face of the column this face of the column this face of the column and this face of the column and there is some sort of perimeter created around the column so this is the critical section or critical perimeter for two way shear so length of this this is l and this is d length of the this is l plus d and width of this is uh, small b plus d okay we also have to visualize in the another another direction how it is seen from the front view okay so this is the column that we have <coughs> and footing is like this then you have critical section at a distance d by 2 from the face of the column and you have soil pressure so what is happening you see this area this area around the column is trying to go in the downward direction and this part of the area shaded in the white color this part of the area is trying to come in the upward direction because of the soil pressure so what we have to do we have to find the net shear force in the upward direction some part of the shear force is going in the downward direction and some part is going in the upward direction so what is going in the upward direction the shaded area is going in the upward direction and this the perimeter area is going in the downward direction okay so what we have to do we have to find the net shear force or you can say the punching shear punching shear force punching shear force equal to q u into shaded area shaded area so what is the shaded shaded area you see <coughs> shaded area is capital l capital b 
L capital L is length of the footing, capital B is width of the footing. Okay, L into B minus the area of the perimeter. Then you will get the shaded area. Okay, so Q U into shaded area is capital L into B area of the footing minus minus area of the perimeter L plus T into B plus D. After finding punching shear force, we are required to find punching shear stress. Punching shear stress which is equal to punching shear force punching shear force divided by cross section area of the perimeter cross section area of the perimeter in two way shear already we have defined what is the perimeter in the two way shear uh, punching shear force this this is the force that we have this is nothing but the punching shear force now we are we have to understand how to determine the cross section area of the perimeter already we have determined the perimeter this is the perimeter the length of the perimeter is length of the perimeter 2 times L, L plus D plus B plus D. So what you have to do, you have to add all these four sides. So you will get this is the length of the perimeter into uh, depth of the footing. The point is that you have to find the cross section area of the perimeter. So length of the perimeter into depth of the footing will give you uh, the area of the perimeter, cross section area of the perimeter. Okay. So punching shear force is Q U into L into B minus L plus D into B plus D divided by 2 L plus D plus <clears throat> B plus D into depth of the footing. So what is this? This is punching shear stress. It is also denoted by tau V. Okay. So now what we have to do? We have to equate tau V with respect to tau C. Tau V should be equal to permissible shear stress permissible shear stress shear stress and what is permissible shear stress permissible shear stress is nothing but tau c tau c equal to 0.25 under root fck so directly we will get the value of tau c uh, by knowing the grade of concrete tau v should be equated to tau c and in the tau v what is unknown everything is known to you except the depth of the footing. So once you equate tau v with respect to tau c and tau c here it is uh, not uh, what we have done in one way sh one way shear. Tau c here is 0.25 under root fck. Okay, so once you equate, you will get the value of d with respect to two way shear. Step number six is about reinforcement. In this step, we will see how to provide the reinforcement in the footing. You see, reinforcement is provided based on the bending moment. And in the footing, you see, we provide reinforcement in both the direction, in the x direction as well as in the y direction. Okay, so when we are providing reinforcement in the x direction, we will provide it based on bending moment in the x direction. And when we are providing reinforcement in the y direction, we will have to see the bending moment in the y direction. In the y direction. So based on the bending moment, the reinforcements are provided. Now, how to provide the reinforcement in the footing? Uh, one one clause is given in IS four five six clause number thirty four point three point one, page number sixty five. So in this clause, they have given how to provide reinforcement in different footing how to provide reinforcement in the square footing and in the rectangular footing so in this clause they have given three different points a b and c 
A is about a one way reinforced footing. One way reinforced footing. Reinforced footing means reinforcement only in one direction. So this A is not about the footing of the column. It is about the footing of the wall. In case of wall footing, the reinforcement will be in only one direction. So B and C is about uh, footing for the column. B is about square footing. If you are providing square footing, then the reinforcement should be uniform. Whatever reinforcement you will provide in the x direction, same reinforcement should be provided in the y direction. This is what is given in point B. In point C, point C is about the uh, providing reinforcement in the rectangular column. How to provide the reinforcement in the rectangular column? <coughs> In case of rectangular footing, you will provide reinforcement in the x direction based on the bending moment, based on m u x, and you will provide reinforcement in the x direction. You will find A S T, and you will find the spacing, and you will provide. Okay, in the y direction, you have to find m u y, and you have to find A S T. In the y direction and directly you have you don't have to provide the reinforcement so what the code says in the y direction you have to divide it into some zone the central zone is called as central band central band okay so whatever reinforcement you have calculated based on this you have to provide the reinforcement in the central band the length of the central band is b and the width of the central band is b it is just like a square footing okay so how to provide the reinforcement in the central band is code 456 has given the formula reinforcement in the central band reinforcement in the central band equal to divided by total reinforcement in the short direction total reinforcement in the short direction means ast in the y direction equal to 2 divided by beta plus 1 now what is beta beta equal to long side of the footing divided by short side of the footing so based on this provision we have to provide reinforcement in the central band and whatever uh, reinforcement is remaining you have to deduct you, you will provide reinforcement in the central band and some reinforcement will remain that reinforcement you have to provide in the edge band these are called the edge band i will write here edge band so this will be very clear uh, when we see the numericals step number seven is about development length check for development length you see we do have provided some dimensions of the footing whatever dimensions we have provided it is okay for the development length or not that check we have to do here to do that we have to find what is the required development length ld equal to 0.87 fy into diameter of the bar divided by 4 into tau bd so fy is known to you depends on grade of steel which is which will be given in the problem diameter of the bar will also be known to you so once you have calculated the ast you will assume certain diameter of the bar and based on that you will get the number of bars spacing between the bars okay so this will be known to you diameter of the bars will be known to you up to this step what is tau bd tau bd is bound strength and it depends on grade of concrete and grade of steel okay grade of concrete you can say not grade of steel grade of concrete uh, you have to get the value of tau bd from clause 26.2.1.1 page number 43 is 456 2000 so uh, when you get the value of this it is nothing but required development length now what you have to do after getting the required development length you have to find how much development length is available uh, in the footing okay so this is the footing that we have and how much length is available 
So this from here to development length. <coughs> and this is also your development length this plus this length is the available development length if available development length is greater than a uh, required development length then the check for development length is okay otherwise we have to revise the dimensions of the footing thank you very much for watching this video i hope that you enjoyed the learning you enjoyed the video thank you very much if you have any question, you can ask in the comment box.